evening, good night, good morning, good afternoon. My name is E.G.M. G. Ross. Thanks for downloading this podcast. The website is rickyradio.com. We are here today to share some incredible information with all of you. So we'll be talking about evolution, involution, and revolution, which are concepts that apparently are very much known and understood by most of people. But in reality, we know very little about them. Did you know, for example, that 500 years ago, Mr. Newton, Mr. Newton, the original father of physics, because the second great father of physics has been Albert Einstein. Well, Mr. Newton, a hundred years ago, he spoke about evolution, but he used a different terminology to express the real meaning of evolution. Um, you know, Mr. Newton, Mr. Newton was an incredible scientist, you know, when he discovered the centrifugal force and the centripetal force, which corresponds 500 years ago to the same evolution and involution, the expansion of the universe or returning to the original point. That happened also within the human machine and also within the universe. But what Newton didn't describe clearly at that time, the Gnostic anthropology or the Gnostic cosmology uh, will complete what he didn't say clearly, which is what makes the expansion of the universe or the centrifugal force or the expansion of the human machine when we are growing up physically, what makes the limit to happen. And also when we return to the beginning, which is shrinking, devolving, returning to the original point, the centripetal force, explained beautifully by Newton, the Gnostic cosmology will reinforce the concept but explaining that there is a limit for that. So who created the limit? Isn't it the law of equilibrium? The law of of cosmic intelligence or cosmic consciousness, which is the same cosmic Christ. All religions speak about the cosmic Christ, the cosmic intelligence. You know, in the Jewish religion, they call the Christ Chokmah. In the Hindu religion, they call the cosmic Christ Vishnu. It's important to understand that this is not only Christianity. All religions speak about the cosmic consciousness, or the cosmic intelligence. The Masons, for example, they speak about the architect, the divine architect of the universe. You know, evolution mean, means an expansion, means a generation, means an ascension. He discovered not only gravity, the law of gravity, he discovered also the centrifugal force of the universe in its march. You know, centrifugal force means, you know, the planets move and dance within the universe the same way our atomic particles also dance within our bodies. You know, remember that the straight line doesn't exist. In reality, the straight line is part of the curve the universe moves in a curve manner, you know, in a spiral way. So essentially, the centrifugal force represents that moving from the center into the outside. Let me give you an example. When our physical parents created us, procreated us, one spermatozoa united with one oval of our mother, our physical mother, and they became the original cell. That original cell 
it started to move in a spiral way, expanding from the center into the outside. And here we are. After so many years, the original cell multiplied, divided and subdivided into hundreds, thousands, and even millions of cells. This is evolution. Applying the centrifugal force, we evolved, not only us, plants, trees, even the mineral kingdom also evolves. What about the universe? Is there evolution of the universe? Of course. New planets appear every day or every certain period of time. You know, new cosmic forces appear within the universe. So this is evolution. Mr. Darwin applied that word, I'm sorry, that concept into, he spoke about evolution of the species. He referred, you know, mainly to the animal kingdom. And he and his followers convinced themselves that after a certain period of evolution, there is a transformation. A species transform into a different species, which has never been proven. Did you know that? It's never been proved. It's never been proved. And our students, our children, our teenagers and our grown-up people are learning something that has never been proven. The theory of evolution of Mr. Darwin that was also reinforced with people like Mr. Huxley and other followers speak also about the evolution of the universe. And they developed the theory of the Big Bang. Come on, another theory. It's never been proven. And people are teaching that, totally convinced that it is true. And they consider Mr. Darwin a genius. You know what's the tragedy of that approach into reality? That if you are a scientist, if you are a true scientist, if you have respect for science, you should never ever create a dogma, a dogma. Religious people, fanatic people are being criticized because they create dogma. Something that cannot be discussed that you have to accept quietly. This is the point, you know, we have reached today a point within the scientific world, within different levels of education, where the dogma of evolution of Mr. Darwin cannot be questioned. Dear listeners, dear audience who are listening to this lecture, allow me to tell you that we disagree with Mr. Darwin, Mr. Huxley, and their other followers. We disagree completely. Why? Because Mr. Darwin was right a little bit. Evolution is a reality. It's a cosmic law. But he was incomplete. Do you know who criticized Mr. Darwin? Mr. Pasteur. Pasteur was another scientist. Mr. Darwin was a British scientist. Mr. Pasteur was a French scientist. Mr. Pasteur said something very interesting. Do you know what he said? All research done by Mr. Darwin and his disciples were incomplete. And because they were incomplete, there were many errors, many mistakes committed during their research. Why? Because Mr. Darwin never saw the opposite cosmic law. The opposite cosmic law, we can call it involution. Returning to the original point, which is what? This is exactly what Mr. Newton said 500 years ago. He discovered the law of evolution and the law of involution. See, involution means 
you know, the opposite of centrif centrifugal, which is the centripetal force, which is the particles and the planets which are expanding within the universe, now they are returning, returning to the original point, moving from the outside into the inside. If we apply that into our physical nature, what is that? Well, when we are getting older, <laughs> we're not expanding anymore. Have you realized that? That, that beautiful suit that you had many years ago, which is brand new, you never use it too much, only for parties or important events, well, you look funny with it because it's too big. We are shrinking, my friend. Are you aware of that? We're not evolving physically any longer. We are devolving, returning to the original point, which is involution. The centripetal force in action that Mr. Newton 500 years ago saw more clearly than Mr. Darwin and Mr. Huxley and other followers. What is that, my friend? What is that? Pure ignorance based on an incomplete work, based on arrogance and selfishness. Because you've got a PhD or many PhDs and you believe you know it all when you don't. We have to be realistic. So evolution and involution are cosmic laws discovered already by Mr. Newton 500 years ago and only developed half away by Mr. Darwin because he never saw involution. We can also say evolution represent an ascension, a generation of life. When we were babies, we evolved into childhood, later into being teenagers, adults. But then after that, we come back to the beginning. We are aging, we are shrinking. So after that, we enter into degeneration. Don't we like the word? Maybe we don't. I don't like it very much. We enter into degeneration of the human machine. Then after we will die. Physically we will die. Our matter will continue transforming into energy. You know, our cells will disappear, but then molecularly we will continue. And atomic Atomically, we will also continue what we used to be, you see? So, evolution and involution, according to Gnostic anthropology, which are our studies that we are trying to share with the entire human race, evolution and involution are cosmic laws. Generation and degeneration are life and death. So, they are mechanical cosmic laws. So is it then life mechanical? Well, part of life is mechanical, but another aspect of life is not mechanical. Our spirituality, our spirit is not mechanical. The spirit, listen to this carefully, the spirit doesn't evolve, doesn't involve the spirit is not imprisoned within mechanicity. The human spirit is immortal. It has always been, it will always be. Here in Gnostic anthropology, we study science, philosophy, arts, all arts, all art forms, and also mysticism, which is the study of religions, all religions. We study comparative religions. So we unite science and philosophy and religion and art into one body called Gnostic anthropology, different than the agnostic being taught in universities and colleges. You know, we don't study only matter 
separated from the spirit or the spirit separated from matter. We study both together because the spirit and matter both are part of reality. Actually, the name of God, what is the name of God coming from? Isn't it coming from Latin Deus? Deus means in Spanish dos. In English means two, number two, which is what? Spirit and matter. Both are part of reality. Now, if we immerse within religion, ancient religions, let's talk about Judaism, okay? or the Hindu religion, or the ancient Chinese religion, because Christianism has proven to become very much incomplete. Why do I say that? Why Christianism has become very much incomplete? Because after the Gnostic Gospel were found in Egypt, 1945, we discover many, many written documents by apostles of Jesus Christ, which are not in the Bible the Gnostic Gospels, already proven as being authentic by the Catholic Church and also by all Christian churches on earth. And before the Gnostic Gospels were found in 1980, 1945 in Egypt, they found at the end of the 1800s the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are also Gnostic documents that interconnect Christianity, listen to this carefully, Christianity with all, all religions. When people convince themselves that alchemy was not a Christian fountain of knowledge, the Gnostic Gospel brought that knowledge. When Kabbalah, that has been considered a study connected with the Jewish religion, the Gnostic Gospel have brought the knowledge that Kabbalah and alchemy are both in the Bible, used by Christians and Jewish and any other follower of religion through the Bible. Do you know, did you know, for example, that the Genesis, the book of Genesis at the beginning of the Bible, that describes the two trees in paradise, in Eden. Two trees. The tree of knowledge, which means good and evil, and also the tree of life. Did you know that the tree of knowledge of good and evil is alchemy? Remember my words, please pay attention. The tree of knowledge of good and evil is alchemy. A very ancient science given to humanity by divine superior beings. Like Moses. Or prophets coming from the past. And the second tree, the tree of life, is Kabbalah. So don't be afraid of these terms. Alchemy and Kabbalah were given to humanity by superior beings. We can call them, them angels. I have, I've been discussing with many Christian groups that are totally convinced that angels, angelical beings, are inferior than people. But you know, if you study the Bible more carefully, there are two kinds of angels. Two kinds of angels. Angels which are lower than we are, and angels which are, which are higher than we are. Those little angels considered lower, they are also called in esoteric language, the elementals of nature, you know, divine little beings that live within plants, trees, flowers, that live within the air, that live within the earth, that live within fire, that live within water. So that means the entire universe is alive. Every atomic particle is alive. And if you study Kabbalah, you will study the absolute. What is the absolute? Albert Einstein, when he developed his theory of relativity of time and space, 
he never said that everything was relative. Pay attention to my words, please. He never said that the spirit was also relative. He only said time and space. Because Mr. Mr. Albert Einstein practiced the Jewish religion. So he knew about the absolute. The absolute, we can say, is the spiritual universe. The spiritual sun that has real existence behind our physical sun and behind every other physical sun in the universe. And all the spiritual suns compose the absolute. So when people say life came from the Big Bang theory, they are again fooling around with science and reality. Because life can only descend from life. Life can only come from life. What are we talking about? That life didn't exist, didn't have reality before the Big Bang explosion? Come on, you know. Stop being Mickey Mouse individuals playing with people's indifference to reality. Come on, you know. What kind of leadership is that? You're abusing, abusing, you know, yourself and abusing people's perception of reality. Life can only descend from life and the universal, you know, fountain of life or the absolute has always been, will always be. It has no beginning, has no end. Can we understand that through our tiny little brains? Of course not. Because our brains have a beginning, have an end. Don't confuse to be, being, with existence. To be and to exist are totally different situations. To be means being with no beginning, no end, which is our real spiritual being. Our, the reality, our real being is spiritual. We are a tiny little piece of the universal spiritual being. And matter and the universal spiritual being created the spirit and matter. The masculine aspect of life, the spirit, fire, and the feminine aspect of life, which is water, the universe, which is also the wardrobe of the spirit. Our human machine is the wardrobe of the spirit. The universe is the wardrobe of the cosmic universal spirit of life. Cannot we see that? Why do we enjoy complicating things when ancient religions have been telling us all this knowledge from centuries and thousands of centuries? And we prefer to ignore that. Why? Because, of course, religious institutions haven't been sharing this knowledge in a clear manner. They have confused people. Also because they've been trying to hold a position of power. And of course, they were involved into politics. They were behind the monarchy. Sometimes they had more power than the kings and queens in the past. And after when we moved, you know, into a more modern world, they were behind many dictatorships. Divorced from science. And this is the problem, you know. Jesus Christ accused those religious institutions and religious individuals who enjoy praying loudly to be seen, considering themselves superior to others, when in reality he called them Pharisees. What's a Pharisee? He described them, you know, whitened sepulchres in the cemeteries, whitened outside, but rotten inside. 
People pretending to be superior spiritually when they were not, full of arrogance and selfishness. But he also described the Sadducees. What's a Sadducee? A materialistic atheist individual. What's a materialistic atheist individual? Is someone who believes, only believes, that there is no divinity, there is no God. They cannot prove anything. So both have been heavily criticized by Jesus Christ. Pharisees and Sadducees, the two extremes who created each other <laughs> through confrontation without resolving the main issue, which is discovering the inner reality of all realities, which is our real being. The absolute, the absolute, the absolute created the universe. And after, at the end, at the end of a cosmic day, it means when a planet dies, we are all going to return to the absolute. So we have mentioned that at the end of a cosmic day, we should the life of a planet. We are all going to return to the absolute, the homeland of the spirit, the homeland of our real being. We descended, you know, from the absolute trillions of years ago as a spiritual beings. We could say we were planted in our specific planet. We could have been planted in any planet. And Mother Nature provided us with the bodies, with the wardrobe of the spirit, with the vehicle of the spirit. The feminine aspect of God, Mother Nature, and the masculine aspect of God, the Holy Spirit, fire itself, or light crystallized because our real being is light, pure light. That light crystallized into fire to procreate the universe or water. And then between the amalgamation of fire and water, here we are. Remember that we are made of water. Our human organism has 80, 90% of water. And our electricity, what we call electricity, we don't even know what electricity is. It's the same solar energy coming from the stars and our own private sun. So essentially, you see, here we are. We are alive. We descended from the absolute. Through the what? Through where? through what is called the black holes. Remember that? Scientists have seen in their telescopes the black holes without understanding what they are all about. The black holes are a way of coming down from the absolute, being planted here, and at the end of a cosmic day, we return to the absolute through the same black holes, which are the door to enter and to get out. But we come back only as spiritual beings. We don't carry matter into the absolute. Matter stays here and transforms into energy. And here we get the moons. What's a moon? A moon is a dead planet. It's a cadaver. Our moon used to be a planet. Our moon, our physical moon, used to be a planet that died trillions of years ago. Humanities used to live in our moon. And when the moon died, all spiritual beings returned to the absolute. And maybe we were later planted back in our planet Earth. This is why native communities speak about that the moon is our grandmother. They say our mother is planet Earth, mother Earth, and our grandmother is the moon. 
and they are right 100%. So the moon used to be alive. It's not a piece, it's not a little piece of the planet Earth like many people believe. Nothing to do with it. When our astronauts went to the moon, they brought some rocks. And through analysis of those rocks, they discovered that the moon is much more ancient than the Earth. Okay? So let's clarify also that point and stop fooling around. Now, so the absolute has always been, will always be. It means we, you and me and everyone else, we have always been, we will always be. Because death, death is only a transition. It's part of the school of learning. We are here to learn, to do what? To experience what we should call the self-realization of what? The self-realization of the spirit and matter, which is to be able to crystallize the spirit, the light of the spirit to become crystallized and to be able to spiritualize matter. When we learn to do that, we unify light and matter. And there is a way to get there. This is why when Jesus Christ resurrected, it's because he did that. He accomplished the highest purpose of life, which is to reach what? Resurrection. To resurrect physically, physically, to defeat physical death. Is it possible? Yes, it is. Can we all do it? Yes, we can. Jesus Christ didn't come to teach us that he was a superman far away from us, and we all had to wait for him to come to help us. He came to teach us to become like him. Same way with Moses. He came to teach us exactly the same. Moses, Krishna, Quetzalcoatl in ancient Mexico, Wiracocha in ancient Peru, Hermes Trismegistus in ancient Egypt. They all came to teach the same principles. The only difference is that Jesus Christ portrayed the physical resurrection physically in a complete manner. The other master that came before didn't do it physically because Moses, for example, his physical body was never found. When he walked away from the multitudes and went up all the way to the mountain where he had descended before, he returned to the mountain, to the top of the mountain. And when his followers wanted to look for him, they could never find him. It means that he also resurrected. They can enter into a an, an spiritual universe or higher universes, higher dimensions of time and space. And they can live also among us, helping us without being noticed. But the purpose of Moses was not to teach us about resurrection or Buddha or Krishna or whoever, you know, had been sharing with humanity this divine knowledge, which is also pure scientific knowledge. Because science and religion and philosophy and art, they are all divine. I'm telling you, one day, Science and, and religion will become one. Don't we like it? Of course, many people don't like that. Science and religion will become one. Remember my words. So essentially, you know, our poor little brains from our physical body cannot understand, you know, that situation that 
our real being has always been, will always be. We only understand existence, which is a beginning and an end. But you know, this is why we need to awaken our consciousness. Now, when we are talking about these two cosmic laws, which are mechanical, evolution and involution, the centrifugal force of expansion of the universe and also expansion of our human machine. And after the centripetal force or returning to the original point, which is the law of involution that Mr. Darwin never saw, Mr. Huxley never even dreamed about it because he was convinced that we descended from monkeys. They never realized that monkeys are degenerated human beings. This is why their chromosomes are so similar to ours. Does it sound insulting? Yes, it does. That monkeys used to be people? It does. It sounds, you know, ridiculous for many people. But because of the law of involution, the law of degeneration, monkeys are the manifestation of the human cells and energies from people who already died and came back in a lower stage. We don't like it? Yes, we don't. But it's up to us. It's up to us to walk away from evolution, involution. Evolution, involution, two mechanical laws. You know, the ancient Egyptians knew about this. They call it the will of samsara. The will of fortune, you know, up and down, up and down, up and down. Do we like that? Well, we shouldn't like it. We shouldn't like it. I don't like it personally. I don't like to live a mechanical life. Is there any way out of a mechanical way of life? Yes, it does. Which is what? Re-evolution. Because evolution is not enough to ascend into a higher level of life. Revolution Re means regeneration. Evolution is generation of life. Involution is degeneration. Can we regenerate? Yes. Yes, we can. How can we do it? Well, this is very, very important. Awakening our consciousness. Cons consciousness means soul. What is soul? What is consciousness? Isn't it the bridge, the bridge between the human spirit, our real being, and the mind and the body? The bridge is the soul. We have to make that bridge enlarged, bigger, stronger. Our perception of reality is connected with that. Awakening our consciousness because we are sleeping 24 hours a day. Awakening our soul. So, when we learn to rebel, listen to this carefully. There are two kinds of rebels. You know, rebel without a cause. And number two, intelligent rebels. What's an intelligent rebel? Well, the one who is searching for justice and really contributes to do justice. But I'm not talking about violence here. I'm talking about an intelligent rebellion, which is what? When we learn to rebel against ourselves, against our lower nature, which is ego. What is ego? Isn't it me, 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 me? Number one, number a hundred, number a hundred, number a million. That's ego, based on fear, you know. Isn't it the same animal psychology? And the soul is real human psychology. The soul means all of us are important, not only me. Because the perception of me is very limited. It's egotistic and it's not intelligent enough. Even many people believe that being egotistic is good. There, is, there was a movie, you know, that was made a few years ago, and now they made part two, when, where they said, 
the main motto of the movie was greed is good, you know. And now they made part two, and pay in part two of that movie, they say that greed is not so good as they used to believe it, because it creates only enemies. The ego, dear friends, create only enemies. So what is the intelligence? It creates wars. It creates violence. It creates divisions. It creates pain, suffering, poverty. Hunger. This is the ego. What is the intelligence of the ego? There is no intelligence. But the soul is searching for peace. Is searching for happiness and justice for all. Is searching for a better world. Is searching for improving the environment. Because we made our planet sick of our own illnesses, mental emotional and physical illness were transferred to our planet Earth. Our ego, which is also an illness of the soul, made our planet ill, sick. Because ego means also unconsciousness, infraconsciousness, opposite to consciousness. So it's an enemy of the soul. So when we understand that the ego has to be annihilated, eliminated, dissolved. We have started the process of revolution of our soul. Transformation. Deep transformation. Jesus Christ speaks about that. The seven deadly sins. Lust, anger, greed, arrogance, envy, Laziness, gluttony, the seven deadly sins. If we transform them into the opposite, instead of lust, making love with love. How can we make love without love? Instead of arrogance, learning to be humble. Instead of anger, serenity and patience. Instead of envy, being happy for the success of the others. Instead of greed, what's the opposite of greed? Learning to share with everyone. Generosity. Maybe you don't have any money to share, but you can share your time. You can go to visit ill people in hospitals. You can give hope. If you have some knowledge that everybody ignores, share that knowledge. Make a little sacrifice, the law sacrifice. You see? So instead of laziness, being industrious. Instead of gluttony. Gluttony is not only eating too much, it's also drinking heavily. Well, moderation. So, the seven deadly sins have to be transformed into the seven virtues of the spirit. We have to. That's a revolution of the soul. A deep transformation psychologically. We have to change our way of thinking. Did you know that Jesus Christ spoke about this 2,000 years ago? When he said, for a new wine, listen to this, for a new wine, we need new containers. What is that? The new wine is the doctrine of the Christ. The doctrine of resurrection. Perfection within perfection. So the new wine is that. Is knowledge plus knowledge plus knowledge. Is wisdom. Is consciousness. Is love. Is God manifested through us. So we need new containers. What, what are the new containers? A new mind. A new mind. Remember my words. We need a new mind. A new way of thinking. And that new way of thinking is a revolutionary thinking. Stop being imprisoned within evolution, involution. A mechanical life where we are going nowhere. Up and down, up and down. Do you like that? Do you enjoy suffering? 
Come on, you know. Come on. Do you enjoy being up and down? Like a toy, you know. This is ridiculous. So the time has come to change deeply because, you know, we're facing very hard times. Our planet Earth is very ill and it's going to recycle by itself with us or without us. Only if we change our way of thinking, we'll be able to cooperate with planet Earth. We have to heal ourselves, then we can contribute to healing our planet. If we don't heal ourselves, well, we will continue being in prison within the law of involution, degeneration. Do you like that? So this is the point, you know, it's very, very important to understand the real purpose of being on Earth. So evolution, involution, revolution, which means regeneration. We have to learn to regenerate, to accept, to be able to accept regeneration, we have to accept that there is something wrong with us. We have to accept that we are sleeping 24 hours a day, that we are unconscious, we are not conscious. You see, that's extremely important. So please remember or try to remember what we are talking about at this particular moment. We shouldn't feel better than other people. We are just equal, but with a difference, which is, you see, when we learn something, is to be shared with the entire human race. If people don't want to listen to you, well, at least we have done our work. Because in another lecture, we'll be talking about the law of karma dharma, okay? We've been around already for a trillion years on Earth. So the time has come now. Maybe the planet Earth will die soon. We are going to return to the absolute. Are we going to return the same way that we left? When we left the absolute, we were a tiny little spark that lives in our heart, within our heart. Our heart is a temple. Did you know that? Our human machine is a temple of the divinity. When we left the absolute, we were a tiny little spark. If we come back to the absolute, the same tiny little spark, what have we done? Can you imagine, after hundreds of millions of years, we come back the same way that we left? What have we learned from life? So, don't we feel that we should come back at least transform into a higher spark? What about the flame? What about the flame? You see, if we come back transform into a flame, when we make the spark grow and grow and grow, well, we'll be successful. The purpose of life will be fulfilled. We said that we are here, you see, to do that, ex exactly that. The self-realization of a spirit and matter, which is to unite them into one transform a spirit and matter into a, a huge flame where we can get closer to God, to the divinity, then we are good children. Otherwise, we are going to be a failure. So basically, evolution, involution, revolution, it's important to understand that, you know, clearly, that, you know, in another lecture, we'll be able to continue developing, you know, new perceptions of reality. Evolution and involution are cosmic laws. Revolution is another cosmic law based on the law of sacrifice. Sacrifice. Our next lecture will be about karma dharma, the law of cause and effect. Karma, we could say, is accounts payable, the economy of nature, and dharma is account receivable, part of the economy of nature. My name is E. Jim G. Ross. So thanks for downloading this podcast. 
The website is rickyradio.com. Thank you very much. All the best.